Welcome to Unit 7, and I am calling this Some Discrete Topics. And what we'll be talking about are topics that sort of fall under a number of categories. We're going to talk about sequences of various sorts and what that means, infinite sequences. We'll talk about series. We'll get a couple of new symbols here, including factorial notation. We will talk about mathematical induction. And in the end, we will talk about the binomial theorem a really famous theorem from history that will allow us to expand a binomial to any power. It will give us an actual rule for that, and it's a nice way to finish up the course. So, let's go ahead and get into it. Well, as you see from the title at the top of the screen, we're going to start with the topic of sequences. And the first thing we'll do is define what a sequence is. Now, a sequence will be an infinite list of numbers, and we will interpret it in this course as a function with domain n, the natural numbers. I'll have to explain to you what that is and how that works. But that's the title. So let's start with this. And I think I'll start with an example here to give you a sense of what it is we want to do. I want you to consider the following. Consider the infinite, now we're talking about an infinite list of things, an infinite, say, list of terms. Okay? Suppose you have the infinite list of terms that looks like this. 1 over 1, comma, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, comma, and the form will be 1 over n, comma, etc., out to infinity. Okay. In general, one might list such a list as a sub 1 for the first one, a sub 2 for the second one, a sub 3 for the third one, a sub 4 for the fourth one, and then the typical one, the nth one, will be a sub n going on out to infinity. Now, let me mark a couple of things here. What is this 1 over n? Well, this is really a formula for the nth term, isn't it? It's an actual formula, so if I ask you, starting at 1 here, if I ask you what is the 500th term, you can tell me immediately it's 1 over 500 because you have a formula for it. Whereas down here, this is the nth term all right, but there's no formula given. It's just a generic nth term representative. Okay? So I have an actual formula here. Here I just have a name. And let's notice one more thing before I leave this. This is a particular list for a particular formula. Here is perhaps a general way of labeling it. And remember, when we have subscripts, often we can think of them as functional values. A at 1, A at 2, A at 3, A at 4, all the way up to A at n. So now the A, instead of becoming some letter with a subscript, can be thought of as a name of a function, the function a, acting upon 1, 2, 3, 4, and in general n. So with that insight into this example, I can go ahead and write down the definition that I've been suggesting. Definition. A sequence, this is the word being defined here, a sequence is a function Okay, that's the first thing to recognize. It is a function. And what makes it interesting? It's a function whose domain is the natural numbers, which is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, up to, in general, sub n, little n, all the way out to infinity. Now, we've never seen functions like this before. Functions, of course, can have domains of any set of numbers. But all the functions we've examined, examined have been functions where the domain was a subset of the real numbers, usually an interval or a collection of intervals of some kind. We've never actually looked at one that was only defined at these discrete, that's hence the title of this unit, discrete numbers. 
Now, in practice, although a sequence is a function, it is the actual function, which is the rule plus the domain, in practice, we usually do this. In practice, we usually refer to that infinite list that was on the other page, the infinite list of its range values because that's what we saw there, its range values as the sequence. Okay, so to bring back the previous page here, we usually refer to this list here of the range values, the A of 1 up to A of n all the way out to infinity as the sequence. Same thing here, we refer to these range values all of these as the sequence, although strictly speaking by our definition the sequence is the function, so it's not just its range values. But in practice the terminology has come down to us historically, we refer to the range values as the sequence. Now all of this is very different from real numbers. Let's keep that in mind. In fact, let me go ahead and try and make some comparisons here so you can see how different things are. Okay? We will write here a of n for our function that is a sequence. Usually, we will write a sub n. Now, that's not something we do with functions of real numbers, but we will do that here. A sub n instead of A of n. I want you to remember, though, that it really is A of n. A is the function, n is the domain element. And what will this be defined for? This will be defined for n in the natural numbers. Okay? And the natural numbers are discrete numbers. So let's write down a few other facts here. The domain of this function A can be visualized perhaps this way. And that's what I want to do here is get a little visualization. If this is the axis where that's zero and this is one, two, three, and uh, so on. Let me see, put some dots here up to the nth case and then so on out to infinity. Then what is the domain of our function? It is these dots. 1, 2, 3, n, etc. The actual dots, separate discrete numbers. Okay, let me write that up here. Discrete numbers are what's in the natural numbers or here on the x-axis, which represents the natural numbers. That is what our domain is here. Now, what is the range? The range is the set we mentioned before. If this is A of n, this is A sub 1, A sub 2, A sub 3, typical term A sub n, all the way out to infinity. Now, we could write A of 1, A of 2, A of 3, but we won't. We'll usually write the subscript. So here we have the function working on discrete numbers as a domain, and here is the range. Now, this is as opposed to what we've seen before, as a, opposed to the real case where we have a function written f of x instead of a of n or a sub n where the x's come out of the real numbers or intervals thereof what will be the domain of f well if we were to draw a picture it might look something like this if this this was one two three and here was n out here right using the same picture as before we might start at 1 and then we could continuously go and include everything, the whole interval of points. So that would include all the numbers in between, not just the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to n. And what would the range look like? Well, we can't list the range. See, up here we can actually list the range in order. We can't do that for real numbers. So this will be a range of some intervals, interval or vols, and it can't be listed. Okay, so these were discrete numbers. What do we have here? What we have is continuous and let's say intervals as opposed to numbers, either here or in here. Now that's a general distinction between the two that we want to keep in mind. Now with that in mind, let's go ahead and look at how the graphs would differ. And to do that, let me take a particular example. We'll take this example here. A sub n is 1 over n. So there is a formula for the nth term of a given sequence. My n's here come out of the natural numbers. That is different. The range 
of my function here is going to be 1, that's 1 over 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, etc., out to infinity. What does the graph look like if I try and graph this? Now, this is unlike the graphs we've seen before. These graphs are graphs consisting of dots. So if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, and this, say, is 1 up here, then I have 1 there, a 1 half there, a 1 third there, 1 fourth there, and so on. This is a picture consisting of discrete, discontinuous dots, okay? Unlike functions of real numbers, which I'm now going to draw to compare. In this example, let me compare the analogous real number function instead of 1 over n. Let me look at f of x equals 1 over x. And since I was doing n here out of the natural numbers, which start at 1, let me say that I'll choose x's here from 1 closed out to infinity. So everything off to the right that is analogous to this. The range of this function is, well, let's see, it can't get lower than 1. I can't get lower than zero, and it can go as high as one, and that will occur at the very first number one. So let me mark that so we're not losing our ones there. Okay, what does the graph look like in comparison to the one above? Here's the graph. Here's the point one, and let me mark off the same points as before, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What's different here is the first point there is one, and the rest of the graph goes down like this. It simply is a continuous a continuous curve, okay? All of the points are on there as opposed to only a discrete number of points up there. So, that is one of the main differences between sequences and, let me box this one in here, a function of the real numbers as we've seen before. Here is the notation we're going to use for sequences. Let me go ahead and write this out. Notation. The notation here is you put brackets on one side, a sub n on the other side, and brackets there. Or, and in here you'd have whatever the formula is for a n. Or sometimes you'll see it written a sub n like this and then n equals 1 to infinity on the outside. That's a way of reminding us that the domain is n equal 1 to infinity. Now, you need not do that. You can just write it this way if you're clear on that. In either case, both of these is the set of range values a1, a2, a3, etc. out to infinity. So here's an example with a specific sequence, the sequence 1 minus 1 over n. Now, what is this going to be equal to? Well, you simply start at n equal 1 and you go to infinity putting in numbers. You're going to get 1 minus 1 over 1, 1 minus 1 over 2, 1 minus 1 over 3, etc. And you can simplify those as you probably want to. That'll be 0, this will be 1 half, 2 thirds, etc. Okay? So there's an example of a sequence. We will be doing problems in this section where you're asked, you're given a sequence and you're asked to write out the first few terms. That's good practice. You want to try that. Let me show you one kind of sequence that might turn up. Write the first, say, oh, five terms and graph the following sequence, the sequence of Bn's, which is defined to be the sequence minus 1 to the n minus 1 times 2 over n. Now again, this is an example of a direct, I'm building up to something later, nth term formula. Okay? I'm calling this a direct nth term formula. You might expect that later there's going to be some formula for nth terms that's not direct, and there will be. In order for this to be easy to calculate, I want to tell you something about powers of minus 1. I think we've said this before, but it's a handy fact, so I will mention it one more time. Handy fact, if you take minus 1 to the kth power, that's going to be equal to 1 
if k is even, it'll be equal to minus 1 if k is odd. Now that's a fact that is clear when you think about it. Powers of minus 1 are either 1 or minus 1, depending on the evenness or oddness of the power. So that's nothing new. But it's handy to remind yourself of that. So the solution to our problem here is that the sequence of Bn's will be substituting in 2 over 1, minus 2 over 2, 2 thirds, minus 2 fourths, 2 fifths, and dot, dot, dot. We were only asked for the first five, so there they are. And I can simplify those and make them look a little nicer. 2, this would be minus 1, this stays 2 thirds, that becomes minus 1 half, that stays 2 fifths, and so on. What does the graph look like? Well, if you graph this, you get something like this. I'm doing this by hand. I'll talk about the calculator in this in a bit. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five. We did five terms, so one, two, three, four, and five. The first one's at two, see? The second one is at minus one. The next is at two-thirds. The next is at minus one-half, which is right about there. The next one is at two-fifths, and so on. And if you sort of visually see what's going on, you've got the curve, the dot is going from there to there, and then the next dot is there, the next dot is there, the next dot is there, the next one's going to be down there somewhere, etc. Now, those lines, those little arrows I drew in are not part of the graph. The graph consists solely of these dots. But that gives you a sense of the movement that is going on here. Okay. There is another type of question that you might be asked about infinite sequences. And it is one that I want to warn you about because you have to be very careful when you do this sort of a problem. Here is one in which the statement is reasonably stated. Assuming, we're assuming now that the patterns continue. The patterns continue in the obvious manner. Okay, now that is really a vague term, as you'll see in a moment. In the obvious manner, write the nth term of the sequence. Okay, and I'll give you two examples here to look at. Example 1, 1, 1 third, 1 ninth, 1 27th, etc. And the second one, e minus 2e squared, 3e cubed, minus 4e to the fourth, etc. Okay? So, assuming that the pattern that I think I see here continues onward, what would I write for the nth term? Well, for the first one, it looks like I've got powers of one-third. The first could be one-third to the zero. This would be one-third to the one, one-third squared, one-third cubed. So I'm going to guess that one-third to the, let's see, the first one is zero. That's one less than the n. So that's n minus one, and I'm going to say that that is, for number one, the kind of sequence that I believe that is. The second one, well, it will certainly have an e involved, but if, e, if n is one, I get this. If n is two, I get this and is three. One of the things I notice is that the minus ones alternate, so let's work that out first. It's minus one to a certain power. If n is one, minus one would be minus one, and there's no negative here. The negative doesn't start till the second one. So if I take minus one to the n minus one, then when n is one, this is minus one to the zero, which is one, which starts here. When n is two, this is minus 1, which makes this negative, and so on. I have the alternation going the right way. Times e, and it looks like this is e to the 1, e squared, e cubed, e to the 4th. And in front of them, in front of the power is the same number that the power is. So I could have uh, times, let's see, n, e to the n. Okay? So I can check this out by putting n in for a few values, and I'll see that I get this. Now that seemed easy. It seemed uh, that there was no mystery there. But there really is something very dangerous here. 
What you are doing is you're looking at a finite number of terms, four terms here and four terms here, and trying to guess what the rest of it is. Now, mathematically, that is impossible to do. Okay? So let me give you a warning and a nice example. To be honest, okay, you can't, can't determine a sequence from any finite number of terms, from, say, only a finite number of terms. Okay, it cannot be done. What you can do is do a problem like that we just said. You can assume that what seems obvious continues and then make a guess as to the form of the sequence. But I want to show you here a very nice example to uh, uh, point up this warning. Here is what I'll do. I'm going to make a list of A1, A2, A3, okay, the first three terms. And then I'll do the fourth term and then show you the nth term. But I want to do this in the following manner. Here are three sequences. The first three terms of the first one are 1, 3, and 9. The first three terms of the next one are 1, 3, and 9. The first three terms of the last one are 1, 3, and 9. They're all the same. So if you naively think that the pattern must continue, then all of what I write over here must be the same. Ah. But let me show you how I can trick you. In this first one, A4 is 27, dot, 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 and the, the nth term that I'm looking at is 3 to the n minus 1. So yes, these are powers of 3, and they're going to continue onward. Now, I claim that the next one, the next sequence, the next term is 19. And I can prove that to you because here's my nth term, 1 plus 2 times n minus 1 squared out to infinity. Now if you put 4 in there, a sub 4 now, you put a 4 in this form, you will get 19. So this is the form of the sequence, and although it looks like it is powers of 9, it's not. Here's another one to make the point even more. This one, next number is 11. And that's true because the nth term is 8n plus 12 over n minus 19, comma, dot, dot, dot. Even more complicated. So when I put 4 in for the A4 column here, put 4 in here, I get 11. So these three, which look like powers of 3, are not powers of 3, and that, that, that is not the nature of this sequence. It is for the first one, but not for either of these. So the moral is, if you only look at a finite number of terms, as I did here, only looking at 3, you cannot determine what the next one is, unless you've made an assumption that the obvious pattern seems to continue. That would have led you to this answer. But the other answers you would never would have guessed. So be wary. OK? Don't make that kind of, uh, that kind of mistake. OK, let's pause for a moment so you can practice all that we've just talked about. When I come back, I'll talk about another way to give series other than giving them by giving their direct nth term formula. Now we're going to look at writing down sequences but not giving you the nth term formula directly. Is it possible to write a sequence down without giving you that form? Yes, it is, and it's very popular, so you need to know that this can be done. So let me make a note here. Previous sequences were given here in this lecture directly. Okay, when I spoke about them, I gave them directly with a formula for the nth term. Okay, that's how you give it directly. With a formula for the nth term, which involved only where the term was, involving only n. Okay, so for example, I might have a sub n equals 3 to the n minus 1, b sub n is 1 over n, etc. So all I need to know is what do I want? The 17th term, I put 17 in for n, I get the 17th term. So I got a formula 
which only involved n, the position that that occurs. Now, often you will find out that sequences are given another way. Often a sequence is given by, well, first stating what the first few terms are. Stating, say, its first term or terms, okay, either the very first one or the first few. Then, once you've got that done, you've stated the first term, then writing a formula, you do need a formula, a formula for the nth term, but this time the formula for the nth term instead of involving only n, this will involve or involving some preceding terms. And it might be one preceding term or more than one. And this is called a recursive formula. A recursive formula. Okay? This is called a recursive formula. And let me give you an example so you'll see what I'm talking about here. Instead of putting things in terms of n, I'm putting things in terms of previous members of the sequence. Here is how the sequence might be given. A1 equals 1, so I'm giving you the first term of the sequence. And then I'm telling you that A sub n is equal to 4 times A sub n minus 1. So every subsequent member of the sequence is 4 times the previous one. This here is the recursive formula. Okay? So what would this look like? Then A1 would be 1. A2 would be, by the formula, 4 times A1, which is 4 times 1, which is 4. Then A sub 3 <coughs> would be 4 times A sub 2, which is 4 times A sub 2 is 4, so that's 16. And let me do one more for you. A sub 4 would be 4 times A sub 3, which is 4 times the 16, which is 64, and so on. So I don't have a formula that tells me where I am with respect to n. I have a formula that tells me where I am with respect to, in this case, the previous term. Okay, there's a very famous formula, actually a very famous sequence, which is given recursively. And let me tell you what it is. It's called the Fibonacci sequence. Might as well introduce it to you. The Fibonacci sequence. And historically, let me tell you about this. It was put together by a man that's referred to now as Fibonacci. But what does that mean? That is really a nickname. His father's name was Bonacci. And Fi means son of Bonacci. His actual name was Leonardo of Pisa. Leonardo of Pisa was his name, although we now call him Fibonacci most of the time. And the sequence we're talking about here is sequence given as follows. U1 is given to be 1. U2 is given to be 1. And then Un plus 2 is equal to Un plus Un plus 1. So the idea is this. The first two elements are 1's, and then to get the next element, you just simply add the previous two, and you continue that on out to infinity. So I'll put this over here. This is just add the previous two terms. Okay, that's what that means. And so, for example, what do I have? I have the sequence, and I can start writing it out nicely. 1 is the first one. 1 is the second one. The next one I get by adding the previous two. That's 2. 2 and 1 add to 3. And then 5, and then 8, and 13. And you can continue this as long as you can continue adding these in your head, all the way out to infinity. This is what's called the Fibonacci sequence. And it's a very famous sequence. It appears in all sorts of places. I'll point out one before the end of this unit. But I just wanted to introduce it to you as an example of a recursive sequence. And on the last part of this page, before I go any further, let me just make a technical remark. This will refer to your graphing calculator. The technical remark is that um, sequences 
on the calculator can be dealt with two different ways. If you have a calculator that allows you to graph it, there is a mode you need to get into for sequences where you can graph it. You can also look at the table feature of your calculator, which most calculators now have, and you can look at the sequence of values on a table. Okay, with that final note, let's go ahead and end this segment, and I'll be back in just a moment to introduce a new symbol to you. Now I'm going to introduce to you a new symbol that we that you may not have seen before. It's called the factorial symbol, and you see at the end there an exclamation point that's not really an exclamation point. It is now the factorial symbol in mathematics. And so I'm going to go ahead and define that for you right now, and then show you a little bit of how to work with it. It will be necessary for what we do later. Definition, here's how it goes. For n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., we will define what we'll call n factorial, okay, that's the way we'll say it when we talk about it, n factorial, which will be denoted n with an exclamation point, there's the notation, and we'll define that to be as follows, we'll define 0 factorial to be equal to 1, and this is for convenience, it makes all of the other formulas work out nicely, so 0 factorial is equal to 1 by definition, okay? This is a definition. Then n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. And this will be true for n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. So we have 0 factorial is 1, n factorial is defined to be that. And just so you get used to it, let me write out the first few factorials. So here, for example, 0 factorial, of course, is 1. 1 factorial is 1. So we'll just put that as 1. 2 factorial, by definition, is 2 times 1, so that's 2. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. I'm just, you see, I'm just starting with the number and multiplying all the way down to 1. So 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's 24. Let me do another one. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And if you try that out, that's 120. And so on. Those are the factorials. Now you may notice that the factorial numbers are growing fairly quickly and they do grow rapidly. There's really rapid growth and let me make a note down here about that rapid growth, and I believe I have a, a small example here that I can pull out, and uh, it's slid away from me here. Here we go. Rapid growth. If you look at 20 factorial, which is really not very big, you've only gone up to 20, not a very big number, that is approximately 2.4 by 10 to the 18th. If you go up to 50 factorial, you are at about 3 times 10 to the 64th. Those are huge numbers. So factorials grow extremely quickly. Now here's a fact that will be very handy for us. The fact is n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial which makes sense when you think about it. n minus 1 factorial is what? It's n minus 1 by n minus 2 by n minus 3 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. If you multiply by n, then you've just gone 1 factorial up to n factorial. Now what's nice about this is this is a way of factoring n factorial into some things that are less. In fact, you can continue this idea. This is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 factorial and so on. Okay, and we will use this fact in simplification. So, for example, I can do a couple of things. Um, eight, 8 factorial can be written as 8 times 7 factorial, in case I wanted to factor the 8 for some reason. Or I could write it as 8 times 7 times 6 factorial, 
in case I wanted to take that 8 times 7, that 56 out for some reason, and so on. Okay? Now, let me give you a warning here. Because factorial is a new notation, and you're going to try perhaps things with it that you think work for other notations, might work for this one, and they don't. So let me show you a few things that are not true. For example, if you have n minus j quantity factorial, just like we had n minus 1 factorial, this is not equal to n factorial minus j factorial. It's just not true. Make sure that these look like factorials here. Okay? That's just not true. And if you want to check it, I'm not going to do a proper proof. I'll just do an example. I will show you that 5 minus 2 quantity factorial is not the same thing as 5 factorial minus 2 factorial. Okay? That's simply not the same. Well, how can I tell that? Because this is 3 factorial, right? And 3 factorial, we know, is 6 from our previous page. That's not going to be the same thing as 5 factorial, which is 120 from the previous page, minus 2, which is 118. Okay, 6 and 118 are certainly not the same number. So there is no such rule here. In fact, none of the rules that you think of are true are going to work. You can't add and break it apart, and uh, you can't multiply. If I could add that up here, if n times j factorial is not equal to n factorial times j factorial. Okay, the factorials are a little hard to see on the screen there, but I'll thicken them up. That is not true. And none of the rules that you could write down that you think are true are going to be true, except for this handy fact up here. Okay, this is a very useful one, and we'll use that. So, to finish this off, this brief introduction to this symbol, let me just go ahead and have you simplify the following. Simplify. And we'll just take them step by step here. A, how would I simplify 6 factorial over 3 factorial? Well, I would write this as 6 by 5 by 4 by 3 factorial, pulling out everything that's above the 3 factorial and leaving 3 factorial top and bottom. They are 1. And so I have 6 times 5 times 4, and I can multiply that out if I like. 6 times 5 is 30. 30 times 4 is 120. So that's simple enough. Or if the numbers get too large, you can leave it as 6 times 5 times 4. Here's another example, say, something even larger. 90 factorial over 87 factorial. Principle still holds 90 times 89 times 88 times 87 factorial all over 87 factorial. Again, those go. And in this case, I'm going to leave it as 90 times 89 times 88. The lesson with factorials is very often you leave numbers as a product until you are forced to multiply them out. If you leave them this way, chances are later that something will come along and divide into them and save you the trouble of working the numbers out. Um, what about 7 factorial times 0 factorial? Now remember, 0 factorial is not 0. It's 1. So this is just plain 7 factorial. And you can leave it that way, or you can write out the number. If you want to multiply it out, I'll let you try that. And so these kinds of simplifications are really very easy. You need to practice a few of these. And when I come back, we'll start talking about how to add the terms of a sequence. Now, we, now that we know about sequences, we're going to talk about adding the first n terms of the sequence. Adding the first n terms of a sequence, these sums that we create that way will be called nth partial sums. And we'll introduce a notation called summation notation in order to make all of this easy to work with. So, here we go. Given an infinite, to make the point that these are infinite, given an infinite sequence, we're only going to be looking at the sum of the first n terms, a finite sum. And here's the sequence, a sub n in short, and spreading it out a bit, a1, 
A2, A3, etc. The sum of the first n terms is, of course, the first n terms is, as you might expect, A1 plus A2 plus up to An. I mean, that's what a sum is. Okay? What do we call this? Well, we sometimes call this the nth partial sum of this original sequence. Sometimes it is called also, this is a finite series. Now, we generally will be talking, if we talk at all, about series, an infinite series. But a finite series would be a finite sum. But usually we'll call this the nth partial sum. I think that is the terminology we like the most. So we'll probably use that. But you notice this writing out a1 plus a2 plus dot, 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 the ellipsis in the middle plus a n. That's long, isn't it? That's kind of long, especially if we have actual forms for these terms. So what I want is shorthand. And here is the notation. This is shorthand. Notation for sums, and it's called summation notation, as you might expect. The shorthand notation. This is extremely useful in all of mathematics. It's used everywhere. We will write, okay, we will write the nth partial sum, the partial sum that we looked at on the previous page, the nth partial sum as the following. We might write S sub n for nth partial sum. Now remember what it was. It was a1 plus a2 plus dot, 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 plus a n. That was the previous notation. Now here is the shorthand notation. And I'll write it very large. And I'll put a sub k here, where k goes from 1 to n. Now this I need to explain. And sometimes the a sub k is put in parentheses. Now what do I have here? Well, let's see. First of all, what is this symbol? This symbol is a sigma. Okay, it is a sigma. What's a sigma? It's simply the Greek S. Okay, that's all it is. And of course, it stands for sum. Stands for sum. Okay, it's simply a Greek S, a big sigma. Okay, you write it large like this. All right, what else have we got here? In here, we have the a sub k. Now, what's that? Well, that is the form of the terms of our sequence. So this is the form or formula for the kth term, since it's a sub k, of our sequence. Okay, so you need to have a form for the kth term in order to use the summation notation. Everything in your sequence looks like this in short. And then what we have here on the bottom is the index, which is the letter K in this case. The index is K. And it starts at K equals 1. So that tells you where we start in our summation. K equal 1, the A1 case, all the way up to the nth case. So this is where, this is where k ends. Okay, that's what the n is on the top, corresponding to a sub n. So the one here corresponding to a sub 1 and the n corresponding to a sub n, these are the things being added. This is the general form. And k is the index letter being used. The index letter can be other letters. It does not have to be uh, k. It could be other letters. Often an i or a j is used, and it's called an index variable. But this is the way this form works. Now let me show you how it works in practice. Let me give you some examples here so we can start getting used to this. Suppose I'm given a sum, say the sum of the 1 over k's from k equal 1 to n. What is that? Well, that's 1 over 1 plus, that's what the sum's about. Sigma stands for sum. So you're not just listing the sequence elements, you're adding them. Plus. 1 over 3 plus all the way up to the last one, which is 1 over n. And I know it's the last one because n is up there. So if you're given the shorthand, this is how to expand it. How can we go the other way? 
Suppose you're given 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus up to n squared, and you'd like to write it in shorthand. Well, it's the summation symbol of the k squareds, where k goes from 1 to n. So there we are. If you know the form, you can write it in shorthand like that. And another example might be this one. Suppose you have the summation of, this is a big one, minus 1 to the k plus 1 times 2 to the k. And the k goes from 5 to 8. So the k didn't start at 1, and it didn't end at n. It just goes from 5 to 8. So what is this? Well, you know from your experience that minus 1 to any power is simply going to alternate the sign between plus and minus 1. And when k is 5, that's 5 plus 1 is 6. That's going to be positive, so that will be a 1. And so the first one is 1, and then we just let the powers of 2 grow. So this is 2 to the 5th minus 2 to the 6th, because it'll alternate, plus 2 to the 7th minus 2 to the 8th, period. That's the end there. Okay, so this is a sum represents this longer expression. And the sum really comes into its own when the number the things are adding is very large. I only did a small number to show you what I was doing here. But if I added from 5 to 100, certainly this expression would be shorter than writing out 100 terms or 100 minus 5 terms. OK, just a few notes about this as we get used to this. The uh, first note is the index or the index variable k uh, need not begin at 1 or end at n. Okay, and that's what that last example showed. It can start anywhere and go forward to anywhere you like. Other, other letters are used also. Other letters are used. And the commonest ones are going to be I and J, although other letters can be used. We usually stick with those letters that are in the middle of the alphabet. OK. Well, then there are lots of examples that you need to practice on your own. Let's do one, say, the sum of the I factorials, where I goes from, say, 2 to 5. Well, that'll be 2 factorial plus 3 factorial plus 4 factorial plus 5 factorial, period. And I'm not going to add those. I just wanted to show you that this is the long way of writing out the sum, and this is the short way. And please realize that when I is an index letter as it is here, it does not stand for the complex number I. Okay? This is context. In this context, the I is a placeholder. In fact, what you have here is really box to the I, or box um, factorial, and you have box equals 2 to 5, where the box can be any letter that happens to be convenient. Okay, and the letter I used was I. I could use K or J or any other letter. Okay? So be aware that that is in context, not the complex number. Uh, this theorem will help you put together what happens uh, when you do addition into nth term, nth partial sums of sequences. So these are properties of sequences that can be written using the summation notation. Okay. If, let's suppose A sub n and B sub n are sequences. Okay. And let's suppose we have a real number around, say C is a real number. Then we have the following properties of sums that we can write out. And these are all obvious if you try a few terms. I'll try and show you a little bit of that, but sum. If you take the sum of C times A sub K, where K goes from some 1 to some N, then you can factor the C out because it's in all the summands. All the things are being added. So as in all the real numbers, you can factor this out front. This is a standard real number property. So this is C times the sum of the AKs, K equal 1 to N. 
Also notice that I didn't put parentheses here, and sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. Usually we reserve the parentheses for when the expression's a bit larger. When it's a single kind of thing, we leave it alone. Okay, here's two and three, and they go like this. If you take the sum of the a k's plus or minus, so two would be the plus and three would be the minus, but it's the same idea, where k goes from one to n, then you can break these sums apart. This is the sum of the a k's from k equal one to n, plus or minus the sum of the b k's from k equal one to n. Okay, so that can always be done. I'm going to continue the theorem here on the next page, but that's always something you can do. So I'll write here theorem continued. Four, if you have a sum of numbers, say a k, k equal one to n, you can break this up into the first part of the sum and the second part of the sum. You can say let's add the a k's from k equal one to j where we're picking some number that's between 1 and n, so j is bigger than 1 and less than n. And then that would be added to the rest of them. That would be the sum from k equal j plus 1 all the way to the end, which is n of the ak's. So this is the first j of them added, and this is the rest of them added, and you can break them into two pieces like that. That's also something that's clear in the real numbers. So I'm not going to work out the proof for these, I do want to add on one special case, five, and this is when you're adding a constant C and the index does not appear here, okay? It's not clear what you're supposed to do. Suppose you're going from K equal one to N and you're adding up this constant and there's no index there. Well, what this means by definition is when you have this situation that you're taking this constant and you're adding it as many times as there are uh, index values here. Now since it goes from 1 to n, there are n index values, so you're going to add c n times getting n times c. The danger here is what if you have, you're adding c, and you're going from k equals m to k equals n, so you're not starting at 1. Well, again, this is a definition, but you just need to think about how many of them you're adding. Instead of adding 1 to n, you're adding m to n. So the first m minus 1 are missing. So this would be n minus the first m minus 1 of them times c, which can be simplified into n minus m plus 1 times c. Okay? Now in context, these are easy to figure out. Uh, for example, let me show you an example here of this last one, just so you see what it is that's going on. Suppose the example is to say, add up 9 from k equal 3 to 8. Now you can do this mechanically. You can say, okay, there's the 3 case, there's 1, 9, there's the 4 case, there's the 5 case, there's the 6 case, there's the 7 case, and there's the 8 case. Right? How many 9's is that? That's 6 times 9. But notice that that is the formula we had on the previous page. The formula said it should be n minus m plus 1, which here is 8 minus 3 plus 1, and 8 minus 3 plus 1 is 6. So this is the 8 minus 3 plus 1 times 9. Okay, so the formula does work, and if you have a smaller number of constants, it's not hard to add them. So that's just a little note I wanted to add to make sure that you were getting the hang of this. Uh, this just takes a little bit of practice. Let's see, let's go ahead and look at a couple of examples here just to practice some of this. For example, if you have the sum of 5 times 1 over k factorial, might as well practice the factorial too, k equal 1 to n, this is 5 times the sum of the 1 over k factorial, k equal 1 to n. You can factor the 5 out, that was the first statement in the theorem. And you can do all of these other operations and you need to practice these on your own. There is one more note before we leave this segment on adding the nth partial sums. I want to observe something here. I want to observe that if you take the nth partial sums themselves, okay, the nth partial sums, which remember I've called for short S sub n, if you take those, 
the nth partial sums of a sequence that we started with, say, a sub n, form their own sequence, right? And that sequence, of course, would be written s sub n. So in an example, let me show you what I mean. Here I've got a sequence of a sub n's, okay, which will be a1, a2, a3, a4, etc. Then what would be the sequence of partial sums? Well, the first partial sum is just adding the 1, a sub 1. The next one is a sub 1 plus a sub 2. The next one is a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3. You see how this is working? The next one is a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3 plus a 4, etc. Okay? So the partial sums of a given sequence form another sequence, this sequence. And you can see what's sort of happening here. If you allow this sequence to go out to infinity, where do you think it would end? It looks like it's ending with the sum of all the original members of this sequence. It looks like this sum is increasing term by term out to an infinite sum. And in that, in fact, is something we're going to talk about later. So that's an important note. Okay, let's stop there. And when I come back, we'll go ahead and look at some specific sorts of sequences. In particular, we'll look at arithmetic sequences and then geometric sequences. <laughs> Thank you.